So by mutual agreement, we're going to begin with a little bit of what I call the Department of Motor Vehicles introduction, in which I'm going to ask you a series of 10 brief questions, in All which right. we're going Thank to cover you, the entirety of your life. Question number one, Dennis. Where were you born? I was born in Orange City, Iowa. Father's profession? Farmer. Grandfather, too? Yes, my grandfather was as well. Multi-generation farm. Mother's profession? She was a housewife, also worked on the farm. Who was your childhood hero? Mm. Uh, I would say Neil Armstrong, first man to step foot on the moon. College major? Aerospace engineering at Iowa State University. <laughs> <laughs> a few cyclones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Graduate school? I uh, went to uh, University of Washington, uh, aero, aero, uh, aerospace and aeronautics. First job out of graduate school? I was a uh, summer intern at uh, Boeing as an engineer and then came back full time as a uh, aerospace engineer, wing designer. So you went into Boeing straight out of graduate yep, school? Yeah, straight out of graduate school. Job you hold now? I'm uh, chairman, president, and CEO of the Boeing company, greatest aerospace company in the world. So that definitely worked out for you. <laughs> <laughs> Work, worked out okay. Worked out. Yeah, yeah. Who is your adulthood hero? Mm. You know, that's, that's a great question. Uh, you know, th thinking back through it, I, I would say my dad. Why? My dad. Why? I, I just learned a lot from him, and he was never a big business executive, but uh, at his core, he, uh, he taught me about integrity, the value of hard work, the fundamentals, and uh, even in big business, those work. Is your dad still with us? No, he passed away uh, two years ago. Two years. Well, I'm sorry for that, but did he know that you held him in that regard? Uh, he did. He did. We had a number of conversations, and he always uh, gave me good advice. As most dads do, he was pretty serious about his advice, but uh, the fundamentals, uh, they always worked. And he said the, you know, the value of your reputation, hard work, integrity, how you treat other people, how you respect your teammates, it matters. Two more questions to yeah. go. What is the most difficult professional challenge that mm. you have faced at Boeing? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I started at Boeing in uh, Seattle uh, and worked on a number of airplane design programs across defense and commercial. And about 15 years into my career, I had an opportunity to take on a new assignment, uh, helping to stand up a new air traffic management business for Boeing, headquartered out of Washington, D.C. That would be a new, a new business for Boeing? A new, a new business for Boeing, and uh, that was back in the summer of 2000 when uh, there wasn't enough capacity in the skies for all the airplanes that were flying. And uh, uh, that involved a move from Seattle to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, my wife had a thriving uh, veterinarian practice in Seattle, so it was a big job disruption for her. We had just had our first son uh, as well. Pets? And, pets, too? Uh, we had seven pets. Uh, <laughs> yeah. three, uh, three dogs, four cats. So uh, uh, this was a big decision, yeah. big career change. Yeah. Uh, I drove a U-Haul across the country with, uh, with those seven animals. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a joke? Yeah, it's not a joke. <laughs> okay. And we, uh, we ended up in Washington, D.C. We arrived, moved into our new house on September 1, 2001. Uh, Ten days later, 9-11. And uh, overnight, uh, the environment went from not enough capacity in the skies to not enough security in the skies. Mm -hmm completely changed the business model, uh, frankly unraveled what we were trying to do with air traffic management. And uh, that was a very, very challenging time. What did you learn? Uh, I learned a lot about leadership, uh, learned a lot about taking care of our people through difficult situations, helping to explain the why behind the business. Uh, and it also expanded my network incredibly. I got to understand how Washington DC worked, mm -hmm. working inside the Beltway, and, uh, but at a very intense time. Very intense and a uh, very challenging time, uh, but also a chance to connect across the Boeing Enterprise, across our commercial space and defense sectors as we tried to manage our talent mm -hmm. through that time. So uh, it was an intense learning time, um, one of the most challenging parts of my career, but um, I still value those leadership lessons. Okay, and the last of our questions to launch the rest of this conversation, what is the change that the company you lead mm. is has not yet made, yeah. but is going to. Yeah. Well, that that is a fabulous question, and uh, of course, with our centennial year, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about this, both looking back but looking ahead. And uh, over the last hundred years, it's remarkable to think about uh, men and, and women went from uh, you know walking on the earth. 
to walking on the moon. Mm -hmm. We went from riding horses to flying in airplanes. And uh, Boeing was involved in a lot of those transformations and the introduction of the jet age and the space age. But when I look ahead to the next century, I think the opportunity for innovation and, uh, and big change is even greater, even bolder than what we had in the first century. I think about uh, even more efficient and uh, environmentally sound uh, subsonic travel, big push for us. But supersonic, hypersonic travel, the ability to connect anywhere in the world in a couple of hours. Uh, low Earth orbit space travel, will that market emerge as a real viable commercial market, space tourism, space industry. Uh, deep space exploration, as you heard from uh, NASA earlier, uh, first person on Mars. I'm convinced that the first person to step foot on Mars will arrive there riding on a Boeing rocket. Uh, autonomous systems, uh, digital payloads, nano satellites that connect the world with almost unlimited bandwidth. And is there a piece of this that you're absolutely sure will happen? Is it all, is it all of it? I don't, I don't think I, I could be absolutely sure about any of it, mm -hmm. uh, but I'd be confident that you're going to see significant progress on all of those fronts. Uh, the, the, the need for that aerospace capability, uh, the ability, what we like to say, connect, protect, explore, and inspire. You know, those, those uh, drivers behind our mission yeah. and our purpose, those are long-term drivers. Let's talk a bit about this position that Boeing is in as a, it's a technology company, it's always been a technology company. It's a hundred year old technology company and that's pretty uncommon. I, I, yeah. I did some digging on how many companies there are that existed a hundred years ago. Mm. And, and you can find lists of this and what I found is there's a hat company and there's a ketchup company and there's a company that makes towels and a company that makes beer and there are a lot of soap makers and candy makers, mm. um, not high tech. And, and among publicly traded companies that were here 100 years ago, there, there are actually several dozen, but almost all of them are banks. Mm. Um, there are some food companies, but among the ones that we would think of as technology, there's only, I could find IBM, Ford, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, General Electric, and Boeing. Yep. So what does it say mm. that technology companies generally don't get to be 100 years old? Yeah. What does that say about the future? Yeah. I think it's really important that high-tech companies like Boeing continue to stay on the innovation leading edge, that we have the ability to remake ourselves over and over and over. Uh, those kind of companies are the ones that go from small innovative companies to big global companies like Boeing. Uh, but part of our DNA, part of our culture has been to always be on that leading edge of innovation. And uh, you continue to see it today. We're, we're bringing more innovation to the marketplace today than we ever have. The new 787, uh, the next generation wide body uh, twin engine airplane, the 777X space launch system to Mars, uh, new digital payloads on satellites. Our ability to continue to innovate products, but also innovate how we run uh, our company. Productivity, innovation in how we manufacture, bringing uh, robotics and automation and 3D printing into our manufacturing spaces. We have to be willing to continue to out innovate, continue to change ourselves to feed the future. David Bradley mentioned this, that, that Boeing holds a special place in history, not only as an American company mm -hmm. that's seen around the world, but also a company whose products have changed the way that we live. And, 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 the, and the great leaps that Boeing has made uh, over, the, over the years, over its hundred years, seem to come in roughly 25 year cycles. Yeah. So a decision was made in the late 50s mm. to try to develop a commercial jet airliner. And that wasn't such an obvious choice at the time. Yeah. 707 comes along, changes the world. Mm -hmm. Every movie you see from the 1960s with sophisticated people, there's always the scene where the 707 takes yeah. off yeah. and they're in this enormous lounge <laughs> inside yeah. of an airplane. 707 and then the 747. Yeah, 25 years later, 747 comes along, wide body. Uh, travel becomes much more democratized. Yeah. Um, and then now, 25 years later, um, the Dreamliner comes along, new yeah. materials, et cetera. But the question I'm getting at is these 25 year long projects, yeah. first of all, they took 25 years. Yeah. They involved billions of dollars, yeah. hundreds of thousands of people. That, that sounds like an aircraft carrier, not a nimble little boat. So my question is when you're talking about being able to yeah. innovate for the future, how do you do that? Yeah. when your landmark projects traditionally yeah. have been 25 year long commitments yeah. where you can't turn tomorrow. Th this is the unique thing about the aerospace innovation model. And it's true, we, we work on the most technically sophisticated products in the world and uh, it takes decades to develop 
build, and ultimately serve our customers. Uh, our airplanes are in service literally for decades, both commercial and defense. So you think about that long-term ability to have the courage and the strategy to invest for the future. And these are multi-billion, tens of billions of dollars of investment decisions. And uh, we have to be a good predictor of the future. Now, inside those airplanes, the technology is rapidly changing. Electronics, software, applications, uh, flight entertainment systems, uh, air traffic systems, uh, different sensors on our defense products. Those are operating at a much tighter cycle speed. So we have to have a hybrid innovation model that's a multi-decade long-term model and a rapid cycle every day, every week, every month model. And that combination is really hard to do and to have the business processes that support it. That's really the key to our success is our ability to have that long-term innovation, big step innovation, but to arrive there in incremental steps mm -hmm. that allow us to manage our risk and keep our technology current. So you need both to watch the tides, but you also need to see how quickly the waves are coming. Yes, exactly. That's a very good analogy. Is it, is it accurate nowadays to call one of your commercial airliners a software device? Hmm. I, I would say it's, it's, it's both hardware and software, certainly much more software intensive than it's ever been. But uh, uh, manufacturing hardware is still a very important part of what we do as well. And we see, uh, we see transformation happening on both of those axes. Uh, manufacturing jobs today, manufacturing technology is much different than it was in the past. Additive manufacturing, uh, 3D printing, robotics and automation in our factory spaces, but also software intensive airplanes uh, and using data analytics to help our customers optimize their operations. Uh, Every day, there's more than 10,000 Boeing commercial airplanes in the air. Each one of those is a, is a weather sensor, an air traffic management sensor. So imagine when you connect all of that information. Is it connected? It, it is connected. How, and how does and that work? More and more connected. That, those are the kinds of services that we're now providing our customers, uh -huh. where we can take these digital feeds from our airplanes to help uh, manage the health of the airplane, to do prognostics and maintenance, uh, to, to optimize customer operations to be able to forecast weather in a more effective way, to be able to uh, forecast uh, traffic patterns and how well, to optimize travel speed. Could you give a little example, say some sort of non-essential non sensor hmm. breaks on a plane, malfunctions on a plane yeah. in, in mid-flight, then what happens? Yeah. So that's uh, where we get into the design architecture of airplanes, the idea that if it's a, a uh, safety of flight kind of item, it, we have to have multiple backups, redundancy d designed in. Uh, so depending on the sensitivity of those items or sensors, uh, they'll have a different architecture that allows us to have a fail-safe mode so we can continue to operate. It's also the power of these networked architectures where if you have a, a sensor that might go out on one airplane, uh, you could rely on a sensor on another airplane. So these, these networked solutions are providing uh, new capabilities for our defense customers as well. Were, were you a, a kid who um, dreamed about airplanes and flight and space and I, I did you know in in Iowa there's a lot of open sky yeah and uh, <laughs> so I had a pretty good view of the airplanes flying over mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I was always always intrigued by airplanes uh, when I was building Legos as a kid uh, I uh, I was always building models of airplanes did your Lego airplanes fly um, not very far. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Their propulsion system was a little inferior. They yeah. made the trip from here to there, yeah, very frankly. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk... Let's Depending talk, on my arm strength. Yeah. Uh, uh, some, do some adult dreaming yeah. now. You, you alluded to a little bit of this, but um, space flight and mm. Boeing's role in it. What's... what's um, yeah. You know, I, 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 I don't want to say what's realistic because uh, anything's realistic ultimately, but what's on the drawing boards that maybe in the lifetime of some of the people here we might see? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a fascinating area for us. Uh, you know, the space business has been around now for 50 or 60 years, and, and we've been involved since it was invented. And uh, what we're seeing now is the emergence of a potential commercial space travel market. So our ability for low Earth orbit access, and, and today you know, routine access to the International Space Station. As you heard from our NASA customer, we've been up there for 16 years operating, experiencing space. But I see that blossoming now uh, over the next couple of decades. Blossoming into a, to what? Into, into what? a viable commercial marketplace, multiple destinations. So you start to think about space hotels. Uh, there are a number of companies that we're uh, partnering with in that area. Uh, space manufacturing, uh, microgravity, zero gravity manufacturing has some real advantages. Research institutes. 
And once you start to develop dozens of destinations as potentials, then you begin to create enough critical mass for a viable commercial model for space access and space travel. So I think we'll, uh, we'll eventually see a uh, low Earth orbit commercial space travel business evolve uh, that will complement traveling in the air. Mm -hmm. So our ability to do both will be important. And I think in parallel, you'll see uh, development of higher speed propulsion technologies that will allow people to go between any two city pairs in the world in an hour or two. Uh, that confluence. I by, but, but that's by going through space. Uh, could be through space or it could be high altitude air breather uh, propulsion. Uh, we're working on new technologies in that area, ramjet, scramjet engines uh, being demonstrated on the X-51 uh, to prove out that technology. So that, that confluence of uh, high-speed travel and low-Earth orbit space travel I think is something that will happen over the next couple of decades. Why, why, why do we live in a world in which the speed of flight from coast to coast hasn't changed in about 45 years? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. If you look at the business model associated with that, uh, at some point, uh, it's less about speed and it's more about the economics. It's more about uh, the efficiency of the travel, the environmentally, uh, environmental friendliness of the travel. Uh, you know, once you can go from coast to coast in four to five hours uh, and you're spending ground time of several hours, mm -hmm. if you take the air travel time and compress it by another hour or two, much. you don't pick up that much incremental uh, advantage. Uh, and, uh, and to go faster than the speed of sound uh, is a big uh, cost implication to the airplanes mm -hmm. themselves. So that, that business model has not closed yet. I think at some point it will, uh, but it'll be for a, a, a fraction of those that want to travel, that have a need, uh, a need to arrive someplace in one to two hours. Like the Concorde was yeah. for a and very small market. The Concorde showed the technology was possible, but not economically viable. Uh, future innovation uh, has to include not only technology, but also economic viability. Does everyone know what the Concorde was? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, we, we went yeah. into ancient history there. Yeah, it's been out of service a long time, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, we're going to be talking a lot over the next two days about driverless cars. Mm. Is there such a thing as a pilotis, pilotless airplane in the future? There, there is. Now, th this whole arena of autonomous vehicles, I think, is another fascinating area for the future. Uh, from an aerospace perspective, we're working across multiple domains, and, and those that are uh, in the air and in the space, uh, I think, are more visible. Uh, we have an autonomous uh, space vehicle, the X-37, which today can uh, come back from orbit, do its Mach 25 S turns, hit the center line on a runway every time, fully automated. Uh, autonomous uh, air vehicles of various sizes, all the way from a small scan eagle that can be carried on the back of a soldier, uh, to high-altitude, long-endurance uh, vehicles that use uh, hydrogen-powered engines mm -hmm. and can stay up for days at a time. But interestingly, that same technology uh, or similar autonomous technology is being applied to underwater vehicles. I think uh, a surprise to many is that Boeing is working on an autonomous underwater vehicle. In fact, uh, we're going to see with uh, the Echo Voyager. What, well, what business does Boeing have going underwater? Yeah. Well, there's... <laughs> <laughs> well, when, you, when you're the leader in aerospace, you get to define the boundaries yeah, of aerospace. Right. Uh, but uh, un undersea operations for both our commercial and defense customers. So when you think about uh, resource access, uh, floor of the ocean access, uh, communications underwater, uh, of the course, engineering challenges are the, the same. The engineering challenges. Uh, and uh, for our defense customers, uh, submarine, anti-submarine, a variety of missions underwater. And autonomous vehicles that can uh, go underwater and stay in place or maneuver on their own for months, perhaps years at a time, are high value. To build Boeing's next hundred years, um, who do you need? Hmm. Who yeah. do you need? You know, the, I think the most, the most important investment we'll make for the next 100 years is in talent. And, uh, you know, we need to stay on the leading edge of technology, that, that technology in our products, in our internal processes and manufacturing. But most importantly, we need the talent. It's multidiscipline talent. It's talent that knows how to operate globally, uh, that has a, a technology savvy and a business savvy to it. Uh, and I would argue that uh, the investment we make in talent is probably the most critical investment uh, we make as a company. You're in, you're in your 30th year at Boeing, yeah. but we're now in a world where um, I think graduates are not expecting 
to have lifelong careers mm. with a single company. Yeah. That model might be changing. So how does that challenge Boeing? I mean, yeah. to, if you, you, it doesn't sound like you want a rotating door. You want people in for yeah. the long haul. Yeah, the, the key is, and, and it's different for different companies, the, the culture at Boeing is uh, we have a lot of people that come to Boeing because they want to do big things, right? I, I went to Boeing because I wanted to work on things that change the world. And uh, Boeing is big enough that uh, you can have incredible career variety and challenges and work anywhere around the globe, work across commercial space and uh, defense domains, and, uh, and have an incredible career but inside a company that really changes the world. And uh, that connection to the mission, the purpose, understanding that we do things that really matter, that lives depend on what we do, attracts a certain talent set that has a little longer term view on, on their career. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, that's not the case for everybody. And we do have some people that rotate in and out of Boeing and that adds value. Mm -hmm. But I think we'll always have a segment of our employees who want to be there for the longer term because of the amazing things we do and, and the long term investments that we make. We're going to take your questions in a, just a couple of minutes so you can prepare those and stand up by the mic. Um, but before we do that, I, I want to ask you about a talk that I saw on YouTube that you gave at mm -hmm. Widener College where you were speaking to a group of, uh, of scholars mm -hmm. who had been uh, uh, chosen for a special program. And, um, and you were there to talk business, as a businessman primarily. And the interesting thing I found in that evening, and I recommend it to everybody, um, is that regardless, almost regardless of what the question was, you kept steering the conversation back to an almost moral framework. Mm. You kept saying business is about character. Mm. And, and you knew you were being videotaped, so you knew that was going to get out. Yeah. Um, wh why, yeah. why, why was that so important to your message that you kept coming back to it? Well, I, I, uh, I firmly believe that. And, and in the end, a big global company like Boeing, with the responsibilities that we carry and the fact that lives depend on what we do, demands a sense of excellence and integrity in how we do it. And what, what makes our business work in the end is leadership. It, it's people exhibiting leadership and character. And no matter where we work in the world, and no matter who we interface with and what customers we're serving, we always have to come back to that touchstone that our leadership matters, uh, that our values as a company matter, that we have a responsibility, given that lives depend on what we do, to give our ultimate uh, integrity and excellence to how we do our work. And to me, that traces back to leadership. And when we talk about attracting talent, we want to attract great technical talent, but we also want to attract talent that has leadership and character. And uh, you know, it's a tough, challenging business, uh, so we need people with that kind of endurance, uh, uh, persistence, and, and focused on doing things the right way. Well, you talked Some, about the wrong way. You said that, yeah. that you said you can be, it can be tempting in business mm -hmm. when you're chasing the bottom line yeah. to cut corners. Yeah. And you made the obvious point that in there, making airplanes, you can't cut corners, but, yeah. but it went beyond that. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's, it goes back to our responsibility, again, to, to exhibit the utmost integrity, because if, if we're willing to cut a corner in how we run our business, Ultimately, that affects the culture of the company. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that'll show up in the services and products we provide to our customers. And so you have to start with the fundamental that no matter what we do, we're going to have that baseline of integrity and excellence. And uh, uh, we have to demand that of ourselves. Some of that, frankly, goes back to what I learned from my dad. Uh, you know, that was a fundamental he taught me. Uh, it resonates with me. I think it resonates with our Boeing team. And I think it's part of why we've been around for 100 years. That's part of why we'll be around for another hundred years. Let's take some questions. Yeah. Um, right over on the right side. Manohar Hiramesh from Chicago. First off, I'm from Iowa State University, so go Cyclones. All right. <laughs> um, my question was, uh, innovation is a very big umbrella, right? I mean, innovation is a word that everybody bandies about. So what is it in particular, any particular innovative technology or technique or process that Boeing is interested in? Anything that the public hasn't heard of that you can share that's yeah. really amazing and that we can look forward to in the next 10, 20 years, yeah. not 100. Well, hey, great question. You know, I, I think uh, people see the innovation that we're putting into our new products. That's very visible. Uh, maybe a couple of examples of things that people don't see. Uh, you know, we're working on new material technologies, uh, uh, micro lattice uh, technology that's 99.99% air, but has the strength of metal uh, based on nanoparticle uh, uh, technology that could fundamentally revolutionize the weight of airplanes and how airplanes get used. Uh, autonomous systems that I mentioned earlier is another good example. 
digital airplanes uh, and connecting networks of airplanes and systems around the world. So there, there's a whole range of technologies uh, that go beyond, uh, I'll say, the, the big pictures you see of airplanes and spacecraft, kind of what's inside them. Uh, also, the manufacturing transformation we're seeing, 3D printing, additive manufacturing. I mentioned automation and robotics. If you go to our, our uh, big factories where we're building the 787, you'll see uh, people and robots working together to build airplanes. Good morning, Dennis. My name is Bruce Cousin from the University of Michigan. Hi. Up top. All right. Uh, oh, oh, way the, up there. The exit okay, sign. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got you. I study applied physics and aerospace engineering at U of M. Um, I want to thank you for coming in today and talking to us. Um, my question is kind of direct towards you. Um, what do you feel that you need to improve on as a leader of this company that you're working on now? Because <laughs> Boeing is currently working on staying on top of the industry and yeah. not being complacent and also bringing the best out of its employees. Yeah. But I think that means a lot, especially being echoed from the top down. So I just wanted to hear from Absolutely. what you're going through. Well, you know, uh, think about the future of the company. And, and one, of the, one of the great things about Boeing is, is we're a big company. And if you have the world's hardest job to do, you want to put an international space station in orbit, you come to Boeing to, to do that kind of big job. Uh, we're not as agile as I'd like us to be uh, in terms of our processes and speed to market. So one of the things we're working on inside our company all the time is how do we, how do we operate as a big company and an agile company? It goes back to the point earlier on these dual innovation models, a long cycle model and a short cycle model, and being excellent at both. And uh, so spending a lot of time on, on uh, what we call our sharpen and accelerate strategy to help us develop those short cycle skills and agility inside of a big company. Rick from, uh, yeah. Sorry, Rick Crandall, Donnelly Financial. Uh, with all the technology you've been talking about, when are we going to be able to know where a down plane is and mm -hmm. why it went down almost in real time? Yeah. Well, you know, that uh, uh, air, aircraft tracking, which uh, obviously that question has come out of some of the recent uh, uh, mishaps that have occurred over the last couple of years, the technology is available. Uh, it's, uh, it's a matter of standardizing and putting it into operational use across all of the airlines. So we're working right now with uh, ICAO uh, to make sure we have an industry standard that allows us to keep that technology current over time rather than specifying a, a particular box or technology that must go on all airplanes. Instead, define a standard that gives us the flexibility for the future. So we're working through those details right now. And you have to understand that you know, every airline around the world, hundreds of airlines, different operating models, the idea of putting the capability on the airplanes takes time. So there's there's an implementation cycle. Uh, it's not about the technology. It's more about the policy and operational decisions. Uh, and, and we'll get there. We'll get there. Hi, Chris Kanish, uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. I think your message about uh, character and purpose really, really resonates. That sounds amazing, part of Boeing's DNA. Yeah. And also when you include in like long-term challenges, uh, what, what I'd be really interested to hear about is Boeing's kind of idea of how to tackle or even think about climate change. Yeah, well, you know, we, we have a role to play in that uh, uh, broadly in the environmental front. So we think of it in, in a couple of ways. One is the products and services we provide. Another is in our internal operations. So we have very aggressive goals internally, you know, within our four walls on emission standards and reducing our consumption, reducing waste. We continue to make good progress on that, but that's a never-ending effort. But when you think about product implementation, a 787 is a great example. This is an airplane that not only provides revolutionary capability for our customers in terms of range payload, but environmentally, the airplane's 30% quieter than the airplanes it's replacing. Uh, its carbon footprint is 25 to 35% lower than the airplanes that it's replacing. So, uh, you know, that's a serious responsibility for us as well. So, continuing to drive environmentally uh, friendly aspects of our products while making game-changing performance capability for our customers uh, we're trying to do both of those. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. And Dennis Mullenberg, see you in the sky. Yeah. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hold well on. Thank you.